<clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. My name is Michael. I'm uh, here uh, with uh, with my partner Keith, and and uh, we got Betty Lou, and we got the some of the choir, and uh, <laughs> it's the uh, of course it's the school break, the first weekend of the school break, so lots of folks are away, including Darren. Darren is off uh, also with his family. So it's my uh, pleasure to welcome you here this morning. Um, remind you that we are an affirming congregation of the United Church of Canada. Yeah, isn't that great, eh? Uh, <clears throat> which means that we try to be as welcoming as possible to everyone who comes through our doors. And that's not just my responsibility, it's everyone's responsibility to be welcoming as we, uh, um, as we are church together. And of course, we welcome children. Uh, we're glad to have them always. And if you're wondering about something, uh, if you're a guest this morning, um, find somebody wearing a blue ribbon and they can help you with whatever question you may have. Probably anybody can, but you know the blue ribbon people are especially designated for that. We always begin by lighting this candle, this flame is a symbol for us of the light of Christ. That sh light shines in our midst and within us, and for it we give thanks. Amen. Please join me in the invitation to worship. It's a responsive reading. Come, my friends, and join in worship. Hear me to sing and pray. <clears throat> we gather together in service to our God. And we need to be in service to our neighbors. Let us then open our hearts to the Holy One. And our hands to each other. And we do so as we pray together, saying, On this last Sunday of the season of Epiphany, we remember, O oh God, the light that guided the Magi to your child, Jesus. Today, we give thanks that the light of Christ shines even now to guide us on our way, a lamp for our feet and the light of our destination. Amen. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lisa Lebrecht, and this morning's reading from the Bible is taken from 1 Corinthians. 3, verses 16 to 23. Do you not know that you are the t God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Do not deceive yourselves. If you think that you are wise in this age, you should become fools that you may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness, and again the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. So let no one boast about human leaders, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All belong to you, and you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. Well, the Apostle Paul poses it as a question. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? But when I was a young teen, I heard about this verse quite often. It was never a question. I was told... Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And always that quotation came with an instruction. So, don't pollute your body with alcohol or tobacco smoke or drugs or rock and roll music. 
don't degrade the temple of the Holy Spirit by engaging in lewd dances like the twist <laughs> or in premarital sex or other activities that were hinted at but that I as a young teen couldn't quite imagine as hard as I tried to imagine them. Now being careful about what you put in your body and what you do with your body was not a terrible message for young teens in the 19, early 1960s. Although when we think about what happened in the late 1960s, it didn't really seem to have had much of an effect. And staying away from cigarettes and drugs and underage drinking isn't terrible advice for young teens today either. Although doing the twist no longer seems to be a threat to innocent morality of the youth that it used to. The only problem with take care of your body because it's the temple of the Holy Spirit is that it bears no resemblance to what Paul says in today's passage. Amazingly though, what Paul does say is even more helpful and a little more challenging than the way his words are often used. The problem lies in the pronoun you. Now English is a wonderful language. One of the things that makes it wonderful is its love of vocabulary. The English language loves words. We have more words than practically everybody else. I'm told that uh, uh, everyday English speakers use about 200,000 words on a regular basis. Uh, other languages don't come close. French, for example, is about a thousand words on a regular basis. A hundred thousand words on a regular basis, half as much. And I'm also told that uh, in English, we have so many words that are so close to each other in meaning that we actually have a book called a thesaurus. It's a book of synonyms to help you figure out exactly the word you want to use. English is the only language in which, we have a, in which there is a thesaurus. Other languages don't need a thesaurus. <laughs> we do. Anyway, English has all these words. So it's remarkable that the word you has to do double duty in our language. It means you, singular, and you, plural, right? You and you. Unless you're in the southern states where I'm told it's uh, y'all and all y'all. <laughs> But other languages, like French, of course, and, and like the biblical languages, they have different words for you and you. And so when Paul says God's temple is holy and you are that temple, he's not saying you, he's saying you are that temple. Plural. Paul is writing to the church he founded in the city of Corinth, and he is saying... You, you as a congregation, you as a community of faith, you as the Christian church in your place, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now remember that Paul was Jewish and Jewish tradition held that God's dwelling place on earth was the temple on Mount Zion in downtown Jerusalem. And there, seated on the Ark of the Covenant, in an area of the temple known as the Holy of Holies, God was among the people. There also, God was separated from the people. As you can see from this model, uh, there's a big... That, I should tell you, the, that, that building uh, to the, at the top with the four, five towers uh, was the Roman military barracks. So you can see how... Uh, how close and, and imposing they wanted that structure to be in comparison with the, with the temple. But anyway, um, the courtyard, the large courtyard uh, at the top of the picture there is the uh, courtyard of the, of the Gentiles, uh, and everybody's allowed in there. But then if you, you'd have to come through a little uh, door to come into this uh, courtyard in the lower part, and, um, and that's the temple courtyard. What's missing from this model is the altar. There was an altar in, in the middle there where uh, animals were slaughtered for sacrifice. So as, as lovely as this place looks, it would have smelled like a slaughterhouse. Anyway, um, there's that courtyard, and then you go through a gate, and then you go up the stairs, and then you go through a door, and then when you're inside, you can see that at the back of the temple there's a curtained off area. Behind that is the Holy of Holies, and there sat the Ark of the Covenant, 
you know, before Harrison Ford got it. <laughs> the Ark of the Covenant, and that was where God sat when God was, was visiting Earth. So, that's, uh, once a year, I should say, uh, once a year, the high priest, only the high priest, um, entered, opened the curtain and entered into the Holy of Holies to leave a particular sacrifice. This was on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And that happened once a year. Tradition says that, uh, that when the high priest was getting ready to do that, the other priests would tie a rope around his ankle so that if he died while he was in there, they could pull him out. And they wouldn't have to go in there to get him because that wouldn't be good. Anyway, so you can see how God is among the people, but protected by many, many layers uh, from the people, or the people are protected from God, perhaps. So in this short passage from today's reading, Paul is saying two things, both of them astonishing. First, he says, God's presence on earth is not just in the temple in Jerusalem. God's spirit is present in you the community of faith in Corinth, and by extension, every community of faith, including this one. That's an astonishing thing for Paul to say. And the second astonishing thing in this passage is that God's presence is not locked away behind a curtain, behind a door, behind a gate, behind a wall. Anybody can enter God's presence because it's us. You don't have to be a high priest with a rope around your ankle. You don't have to be a priest at all. You can be a regular person. You don't even have to be Jewish. You can be a Gentile. In his letter to the Galatians, Paul expands on that. He says, no, you don't have to even be Jewish. You don't even have to be a free person. You can be a slave. You don't even have to be a man. You can be a woman and enter into God's presence. That's a radical idea in his time. For, he says, you are all. And let me just emphasize that. You are all one in Christ Jesus. All seen in God's eyes. Equally. Now, elsewhere in his writings, Paul makes it clear that we as individuals can indeed be filled with the Holy Spirit. But in this passage... He's saying that we as a community of faith are a temple. We as a congregation are the residents of God's spirit, the dwelling place of God's spirit on earth. Think about that for a minute. As I said to the children, you know, church is not a building, church is not a steeple, the church is not a place at all, the church is the people. You want to sing it with me now? I am the church, you are the church, we are the church together. All who follow Jesus all around the world, we are the church together. Yeah. Now, it's a children's song now, but in Paul's day, it was a radical thought that the temple of God is people, not a building. We are the temple of God. Later in 1 Corinthians, Paul will say that we're the fingers and toes and elbows and knees of the body of Christ, which is the church. But here, though, he's saying that each of us is a brick or a joist or a windowsill in the temple of God. I, I try to avoid referring to our church building as the house of God or a house of God. I worry that it reinforces the idea that God's dwelling is this space. That people can come here to visit with God, but then when they leave, God will stay behind because this is where God lives, in this area here. No. The house of God, the residence of God, the dwelling place of God is not found in architecture at all, but in us. Plural. There's a story about a, a nobleman in, the, in medieval times who uh, thought he would uh, give a gift to the people of his town and, and leave a legacy for himself by building a church, perhaps like, uh, 
like this church in the Lombardy region of, of Italy, a medieval church. Uh, so he brought in workmen and they worked for years and to lay the walls and do all the inside stuff. And finally, when it was ready, he invited the whole town to come and see the inside of the church. Uh, and oh, they were they were filled with wonder. The, uh, the workmanship of the masonry work and the, there was artwork on the walls and the woodwork of the pews. They were just, but after a while, they realized they were all squinting to see this stuff. It was dark in there. There was just that window in the end and, and uh, there was no chandelier or anything. So finally, one of the townspeople got enough nerve and said, my Lord, um, it's a bit dark. Ah, says the nobleman. You see the, uh, the brackets on the wall above each pew, he said. If you go to the front of the church, there are lanterns. What I want you to do when you come with your family is to take a lantern, light it from the light of Christ, the candle, the Christ candle, and take it and hang it above your pew. Because when the place is empty, when you don't come to this place, it is dark. But when we come together, we bring the light. We fill this place with the light of Christ. We become, we become the temple of God. There's another story about church too. Uh, but a, a young woman uh, who uh, gone to church all of her life, and, and one Sunday she brings a boyfriend. She's got a new boyfriend, so she brings him to church. He's not a churchgoer, not used to it. But halfway through the service, he leans over and he whispers, he says, this is boring, he says. And shh, she says, it's supposed to be boring. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I try really hard not to, not to let that happen. <laughs> Church isn't supposed to be boring. Church is supposed to remind us that when we come together, we are the dwelling place of God, God's Spirit. A Sunday church service is a meeting of the Temple Building Committee. And in that meeting, this meeting, we decide what kind of a temple we are building. Now remember, I'm talking about the people, not the building itself. Are we an accessible temple as a people? One that makes it easy to enter? Or are we closed off so that only people like us would feel comfortable here? The people, not the temple. Does the temple, um, does it have windows? The temple of our people. Does it have windows so that we can look out onto the world and see what's going on? Or is it blank walls so that we turn inward and become concerned only with ourselves? Again, I'm not talking about these walls, which actually don't have windows. Uh, but us as a people, are we outward looking or inward looking? Are we as a people a fancy temple? So that the rich would feel comfortable here, but the poor would feel left out. Actually, that reminds me of another one of, this is one of my favorite church stories. And it's a United Church minister who's helping a, a, a family that's fallen on hard times in his community. And he takes them over food and stuff. And one day he's over there taking some stuff and he says, you know, we, we'd love it if you guys came to church. If you just joined us on Sunday mornings, we would love that. Oh, no, Reverend, we, we, we couldn't do that. Uh, we, we don't have any decent clothes. Oh, no, he said, don't worry about that. We're not that kind of a church. No, you, you just, just come. We don't care how you dressed you are. No, no, we... We'd stand out. We wouldn't, we wouldn't feel comfortable. I, I don't think we could do that. Hmm. So he goes back and he meets with his outreach committee and they decide, well, let's buy them some clothes, some good clothes, some, some Sunday go to meeting clothes. So they do that. They go out and get clothes for the whole family and still they don't come to church. Well, the next time, after a few weeks, he's over there again and, and uh, he says, you know, we, we bought you all those clothes so you could come to church and we haven't seen you. Well, she said, you know what? We put those clothes, we intended to come, and we put those clothes on on a Sunday morning, and, and we looked at ourselves, and we thought, we look so good, we look so respectable, we thought we ought to go to the Anglican church. <laughs> Love that story. Now, I don't think that we are inward-looking. I don't think that we're inaccessible. I don't think that we're self-righteous. But those are behaviors and attitudes that temples are prone to. 
It's only as we, as we remain aware of our tendency to become inward-looking and inaccessible, a closed little club. It's only then, as we are aware of that, that we can make ourselves a temple that serves God and our neighbors as well as ourselves. As Paul himself writes, all things are ours, but we belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. Thanks be to God for that. Amen. Anyway, as we go from this place today, uh, let's go with a, a song in our hearts and, uh, and the remembrance that, uh, that we are where God lives. Go now in peace, and may the grace and love of our Lord Jesus Christ go with you all this day and evermore. Amen.